All right, guys, welcome to the podcast. Today, I have a wonderful guest. Um, I like to be able to bring into this uh, podcast different backgrounds, different experiences. Um, the main theme, for those of you who have already watched a few of the episodes, you know it's about the man in the arena. Today, it's going to be about the woman in the arena, in the arena of the areas of her experience, which is very vast. And I think you you will find uh, Joe's experience, her, her work experience, and the places that she's been to, to be very, very uh, important information for many of us here today. And you'll see why. Um, so I've asked Joe to come on the podcast. We actually met um, through a mutual contact. We'll talk about that in the podcast. Uh, but first, I want to give you guys a little bit of a background. Now, her background is uh it's got about 10 times longer my my cv okay um because <laughs> she's literally been on many 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 places around the world and has really a wealth of experience and um so she's an independent field researcher and educator who has worked as a contractor for the u.s department of state irex u.s aid these are all uh uh in in uh, in uh apostrophes, I guess, or in big letters, and the U.S. DOD, Department of Defense, for those who don't know. And then the other ones you can Google if you don't know what those are. Uh, she completed training at Fort Leavenworth as part of the U.S. Army Human Terrain System and has worked with various agencies and, and universities in China, Kurdistan, Israel, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Ukraine, Russia, Malaysia, you guys following? Saudi Arabia, Armenia, UAE, Morocco, and a number of other countries. So um, that's just to give you just a short, brief background. Um, so my guest today is Joanne Patty Munsidery. You're going to have to correct me because I know people keep asking me about how to say my name. Your last name is, is hard for me to, to pronounce. Um, so without further ado, Patty, please uh, tell the folks here who you are, a little bit about yourself, a little bit of a background, uh, and how you got into this very interesting field of expertise. Thank you, Doron. Don't worry, a lot of people have a hard time with my last name. You can think of it as monastery with a U sound, munistery. Ah, and easier. Patty is my middle name because it's my father's real last name. So people can just call me Joe, although legally I'm Joanne. I grew up as the oldest of six children. I was born in New Jersey. All of us were born in different places. My father is from Italy and my mother's family is from Italy. So we're first generation born in the United States. Uh, we moved to Texas when I was 11 and I graduated from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service back in the day when they had a quota of no more than 12% females. <laughs> and I uh, did my graduate work in traditional Chinese medicine and in education in New Zealand, where we were dual citizens. I was married to a U United States Air Force PJ, pararescue um, special operations community. And then we moved to Australia for my work uh, my son, our son was born there, Denali, and our daughter was born in New Zealand where we lived for many years. I um, got into international work early in my 20s and then I went away from it. I think um, a number of people who were during that time at the Foreign Service School and um, that was during the Vietnam War, even though we were trained to go into the Foreign Service, we decided that wasn't what we were going to do. And so for a while, I was in the performing arts. I graduated from Circle in the Square Performing Arts School in New York. And I was in all the media in my 20s, film, um, soaps on television, commercials, a lot of theater. I really enjoyed theater. And I had started dancing since I was three and uh, then became a choreographer after a very serious injury in New York. But when, after I got married um, and I had worked in Australia before, we decided to go back to Australia. I've worked with uh, indigenous populations in many countries, 
The longest was with the Aboriginal uh, population in the Gumbangi Nation. And part of the reason we moved to New Zealand is I was invited to work as a choreographer for the National Maori Dance Company. Um, mm. And we became um, dual citizens there. I'd been to, I think I'll mention this early on. I, early on in my life, I was in the Middle East and in um, Israel. I worked in Israel starting in 1975 after the 73 war. My um, background at Georgetown University Foreign Service, at that time we had concentrations and mine was the Middle East. So we studied the religions of the Middle East, the languages of the Middle East, but it's very different once you actually go to the Middle East mm -hmm. <laughs> and live there. Um, so my association in with Israel has been since 1975, since being there, but I went back at different points because part of my medical expertise is post-trauma mm -hmm. and I did rotations in Israel and then studied more with Master Lee John Fung, who was uh, at that time, came and taught in Israel um, on Kibbutz Dot Yom. I went back to Kibbutz Dot Yom for training there and then um, the last work I did in terms of paid work and uh, official work was through the Near East Division of the State Department in 2018 when they had a project on negotiation education. Mm -hmm. And that was in advance or right about the same time, uh, Nissan, March uh, 2018, um, in advance of the embassy moving from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, a very uh, special project uh, with all different sectors of Israeli society. I deployed to conflict zones a lot of the last, hmm, since uh, 2006, so mm -hmm. eight, 18 years. And I left the last time I left uh, working officially um, was in Kurdistan in 2020, March of 2020, when the pandemic restrictions forced everybody to leave. We had to leave within 72 hours. Huh. So and, I remember when, when we got to, to meet here in Israel, and maybe you can talk about how, how that kind of came about. Um, mm -hmm. It was actually a very pleasant surprise for me because <laughs> when, you, when we ended up uh, uh, meeting each other, normally the, the, you know, a lot of the people that, that will either want to see Israel or whatever, through my lens, so to speak, um, I'm kind of the one who's 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 leading and, and explaining and what have you, and and uh, being around you, it was like I was actually learning from you because you had a, a much different um, background than most of the people I've actually met throughout my time and experience of of, of receiving people in Israel or what have you, and. Um, one of the things that you said that really was interesting to me, because this is just to, to caveat into what you were saying, because you were going through a lot, a lot of stuff here. And I just read a little bit of your of your background uh, experience. You have a very vast experience and, and you've been on many, many uh, parts of the globe, working in different places, different citizenships and so on. And you mentioned something you said, you know, you know, because because you were talking to young mothers, right? And I heard the conversation that you were having with them, and you were mentioning that you don't have to put your dreams aside, or whatever it is that you have in your heart that you want to accomplish in life, uh, because you're being a mother, right? Like you're saying something like that, uh, to that effect. And and I thought, yeah, that's, I mean, no kidding, because it's like when I look at you, and 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 just from from getting to know you a little bit. I'm like, wow, like the, the things that you've accomplished, a lot of working women, right, in their young age and actually putting aside um, child raising, right, and, 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 and pursuing their, their careers and putting the kids to, to uh, 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 after school activities and what have you, right, to where they can continue and pursue their careers because they feel it's so important, like I'm young now and, and now I need to accomplish this and now I need to do this and everything needs to be now. You had a very wise answer to me, at least, that I was like, wow, that was pretty cool. And you've proven it with your own life of you don't have to set everything aside because you're raising your children. So you kind of had a really cool order there that um, that is not very common 
in today's, at least in today's world. Uh, right. It's like either or, right. You have to either pick the corporate life or the family life. You can't have them both. And in a way that that's what I understood from you. And that, that's the choice that you made is that you actually did both. Can you explain that better than I, I just. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm glad that conversation resonated with you. I didn't realize y'all were listening. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I, uh, I do feel very strongly that when the children are young, they absolutely have to be the first priority. Mm. And so I changed my profession from the performing arts to teaching. Mm -hmm. And I knew about Waldorf education. And I, when I, part of the time I was working with San Jose Rep and San Jose Ballet, which is where I met my husband, Marty Schmidt, I, uh, we were going into schools, outreach into schools. And that's when I decided it was very important uh, to switch. When I became pregnant, I knew about Waldorf schools. And when I was actually pregnant with Sequoia, my daughter, I uh, finished uh, teacher education. And I only worked very part time until my daughter was in uh, kindergarten in the Waldorf schools. And I, I taught in the same schools my children were in until they were in middle school, at least. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, you can do both, but I, my priority always was, and I come from a very traditional Italian family, so my mm -hmm. tradition, uh, you know, impressed upon me, and I think it's very important for me to say that, yeah. that uh, young children especially, but children at all ages. I mean, my youngest is now in her 30s. I still have to talk to her about certain things. Um, if she'll listen. <laughs> but um, yes, uh, you can do both, but you can do it incrementally and it's a question of your time management and your priority management. Uh, mm -hmm. It was different for me than many, although not many in Israel, because my husband was, after he was in special operations, he was even in a more dangerous job and gone more of the time. He was an international mountain guide. Mm. And, yeah. uh, that's how he and our son both perished on K2. Yeah. Um, but uh and so when your your spouse is gone, and at that time we weren't here, any extended family, yes, you really have to prioritize your time. Mm. And I'll say this because other people might be listening in terms of mothers and, well, parents, yep. is uh, no TV. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. I was the mother <laughs> in the world uh, when <laughs> children were in middle school and high school. Um, and no, uh, at that time, most of the time, I think we had internet. I had internet at work in the 90s, but we didn't have internet at home until they were in high school. Mm. So uh, they don't have the same pressure. I mean, they have more pressure now with social media and internet and none of the spy phones. We just had little uh, Nokias, you know, and then the internet. <laughs> so I, I know love, it's- I love how you call them spy phones. That's what they are. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be real. They're tracker phones. Um, 100%. 100%. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit, maybe, too, actually. Uh, I'll try to remember that. Um, so as for women, um, I was very fortunate, and I didn't plan my life this way. And I'm a very, you know, I'm a deep person of faith. So mm -hmm. many times I didn't even want to go some of the places. Once I was proved, I guess you'd say, I proved that I could do well, grace mm -hmm. under pressure, conflict zones. That's yeah. all I got offered. Because by that time, I was in my 50s and 60s. Yeah. And nobody else wanted to go to the jungles of Borneo and places like that. But I said, okay, I'll go. <laughs> and wow. um, I learned a lot. So, you, you know, and I, I'm i still upskilling all the time. I'm upskilling on tech. I am I read all the time. It's, as I say, it's a question of priorities and time management a lot. Mm -hmm. For sure. And you, you actually were educating me. So just to, you know, for the audience out there. Um, so, yeah, so you were talking about, like, I guess we can get into that a little bit right now, um, is this issue about spyware, spy tech, right? Um, how much are you aware of the technology you're using that is actually spying against you, right? Or gathering information from you for different entities, for different purposes? Um you want to know how much Should... I personally am aware? <laughs> no. I, what, what I want to say is, though, <laughs> the question really is, how aware do you think people are? And 
what kind of what kind of things do you would you recommend for people who who want to be more who want to be more uh, to protect themselves, I guess, right? Like what kind of steps can they take uh, and things they should be, you know, for your normal Joe Schmo, obviously we're not talking about, you know, uh, you know, high tech, uh, um, you know, uh, Snowden style (laughs) protection or whatever, but you know what I mean? Yes. Or ethical hackers, ethical hackers. Yeah. The basics. (laughs) Um, I I didn't mention that until 2022, I worked on a special project, which included Al-Quds University in Abu Dis, Jerusalem. Oh, yeah. Uh, And that was until September 2022, only two years ago. Mm -hmm. So, um, and part of the reason I mentioned that, too, is that one of the, I was director of a special initiatives for new curriculum to be done in English, Arabic, uh, Russian, because it was with different universities and English. Hmm. Um, and I created, when I was in Ukraine, I'd created a new curriculum called Information Literacy to teach, at that time, university medical students. But we also used it uh, as a trial for, with some high school students in different countries. So I do think that that needs to be part of the curriculum and information literacy because mm-hmm. if their parents don't know, then they will know. Just from the very simple basics is how to know if it's a credible source. Does it say ORB? Does it say EDU? Does it say COM? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, in terms of tracking, and especially with all the new AI tools, which I, I just have a fascination for, so I sort of try them out. Um, mm-hmm. Perplexity is the newest one I've tried for research. But some of the AI tools are very handy for research. They save you days or hours Mm -hmm. of time that high school students and university students and other people that want to research can use. But parents, I do think, need to be aware. There are, um, I mean, even back in 2000, I was the, the, I guess you call it principal. They don't call it that in Lakota, in Waldorf schools. But at the Denver Waldorf School, I was the high school principal, if you will, after Columbine. Mm -hmm. And uh, we we got net nannies in the computer labs so that we knew if they, first of all, they couldn't go on to certain sites, but it also showed us if they were trying to research certain sites. And that was uh, back in 2000. So there's very sophisticated tools. It's just a lot of school systems here in the United States. And I know because I've worked in them since I've come back. to employ them and worldwide they could so that's one way that at schools they can't but the other way is is uh, you have to do it on your own um, hardware that you have and many people they don't even want to buy a VPN for their phones and their computers I mean it's a prophylactic it's not perfect but uh, you you need them especially if you're in public excuse me, places for people not to harvest your data without mm. you knowing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I exactly. recommend, I mean, I, I'll just say one, because it even worked when I was in China, because I trained with the Shaolin back in 2018, 2019, and way up in the mountains, it still worked. And that is Nord, which is, I believe, a Scandinavian originally um, product. It's, yeah, it sounds Scandinavian for sure. Mm. So what about... What about the the dangers of tech? Like you mentioned, parents need to be aware, and I think this is an important subject that people need to be aware of. So I can say, for at least from my experience, right, in um, exec- executive protection and the type of stuff that we've studied as far as learning how, how do you call them, uh, how these creeps are trying to track your subject or follow them, right message them etc right um mm-hmm. and so uh was oh yeah that's the word predator you have these these predators that are that are that are trying to reach your children because they have uh a desire for younger uh right um companionship i guess you could say companionship uh, too nice yeah, I'm trying to be I'm trying to be nice about it, but you get what I mean. And and so so I think can you explain to, to a little bit about that? How, yeah, parents yeah. need to be aware of, of of those open doors through tech. I guess is a good way to to kind of. 
Yes, uh, there's all different kinds of portals, uh, yeah. tech portal, spiritual portals. Um, so you want to be careful as much as you can these days. I, I talk to parents um, in many countries, in fact, about the internet highway. You wouldn't want a young child going on the highway. No, no way that you would let them go in the middle of a highway. And yet mm -hmm. you let your, your uh, computer or your laptop or your phones be unrestricted and they're on the internet highway. Even if they don't want to be, ads will come up, mm -hmm. very inappropriate ads, you know, to users of all ages. There's no yeah. restriction really yet. So how to be, uh, again, this takes the courage and the priority of the parents because mm -hmm. that's where it starts. But I see it in schools. I've been substituting in public schools for a few months and I was working up in Alaska and uh, so whether it's remote Alaska or city public schools, uh, the kids, the children, the students have access to almost everything. And even those Chromebooks are programmed with certain programs. This is mostly in the West and in, in other countries. This isn't the case, fortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But right. In Israel, it's also, you know, I was astounded and through part of my training that I've had um, and and used, you know, we use very sophisticated tools, which are now pretty commonplace to use. Um, not as sophisticated, of course, as the military personnel or um, people in intelligence use, but still, uh, you'd be surprised what 14 and 15 year olds can do in terms of hacking. And, um, you know, the fact that the um, the terrorists, and not just in Israel, but in other places. I was very surprised when I was in Pakistan in 2010, 2011, so 14 years ago. Hmm. And some of the teachers, because they had to be indoors all day because of the danger and the society and so forth, they upskilled themselves on tech tools. They were more tech savvy than I was, mm -hmm. which really me when I got to Pakistan. And uh, so the enemy has a vote, the adversaries, whether it's from child predators to terrorists to the combination of the both. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in Kurdistan as well, you know, they, they Google Earth, the open source tech, Facebook, I call it Facehook. I know, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people have to use it, but I, I tell people, and I, even my family members, please don't put your children on there all the time. I mean, you're not giving them a chance of privacy later on in their life. And not only that, people who really want to, really nefarious people and organizations, we're not talking about just individuals, mm -hmm. and use AI for nefarious purposes now. Yeah. They, they can track you through um, your address, you show pictures of your room, Here's mm -hmm. something scary that I found out working in Alaska, public schools in a different sector, not as a teacher, is that a lot of the, the um, in, in the United States anyway, and I have a feeling it's probably in Canada and other schools in, West, in the West, is the laptops that they give them, they, give, they loan them, they have spyware in that, and they can turn on the camera and find out if your child is in a room and... There's already been some predator cases of um, really criminal, I won't even say unethical is too kind, criminal kind of uh, administrators and teachers and people using that to target mm. children. Mm. So uh, I believe it's a whole nother realm of safety, just like when that was the horses to the automobiles, um, people had to then start training their children, don't go in the street. And then when the automobiles put on your seatbelt, so it becomes automatic, like brushing your teeth, all these kind of new safety factors are very important for life today. Mm -hmm. For the tech that, that is uh, evolving and, and, and yeah. It's so fast too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other part is a kind of code that I know teenagers here use mm -hmm. um, so, that, so that the parents and even the teachers may not know what they're texting, but they're actually texting using different code words for meeting up for sex, for example. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or drugs or what or have drugs. you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's important. And I think that's just something for the parents out there who are raising children. Um, I think you pointed out something that was important and that's something that we're, that we practice in our home is that we don't have a television. We don't put our children in front of a television. And what that means is essentially as a parent, I have to put in way more effort and time with my child, more attention, right? While juggling life like everybody else, right? Yes. Um, all that to say, I'm not a saint. I'm just saying if I can do it <laughs> with my challenges as a human being, then you can do it just as easily. It's just not as easy, so to speak, as easy in the now. But I think what people don't realize is long term because you keep putting them in front of a your I see a lot of parents here, at least they put their phone and they say, here you go to their kid. You know, here, look at this. And the kids are sitting there, you know, and I want your phone. I want your phone. Give me your phone. Right. And the only thing that's going to get them to shut up is saying, here's your phone. Um, well, they've been conditioned to shut up with that. Yeah. You or know, the iPad I, or whatever, right? Yes. And uh, I'll give you a realistic example because this was not so long ago, nine years ago now, but I was in Italy asked to come in for a, a Waldorf school that had some problems there and in the high school. And the first thing I did was, of course, it's a private school, hmm. said uh, no phones. Children can't have any phones. The, when they come in in the morning, they're given to the receptionist. So that if there's an emergency or the parent needs to contact them, they do that through the receptionist. Mm. Um, and it takes more effort, you know, to catalog. And, and in, in Malaysia, we did the same thing in, in, in Borneo at the high school. In fact, the, the students actually made their own thatched uh, woven covers with their name on it for their for their phone, and then they put them there, and they don't get them back until after school. Um, Catherine Birbal Singh and the Michaela schools in, in the UK, which do the best in inner city London with all sorts of economic uh, strata in those schools, uh, same thing, no mm -hmm. phones in the school. And it made, at first two weeks, the first week there was a lot of pushback from the students, second week less. By the third week you saw the students playing soccer with each other, bringing cards to school, a chess set. You just saw the social life completely change. They were doing their homework there. You know, they saw such positive results that after a while there was no complaining. That's awesome. I'm glad it that was, you shared that because- I think Two yeah. or three weeks and all the faculty and everybody has to be on board. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's really good because you're giving real world ex uh, examples of when enforcing um, what would be harder you doing as parents, right? Um, it would be easier for you as a teacher. I mean, hello, parents. Think about this. What if you send your kids to, to school? Do you expect the teachers to use a different uh, medium to educate your children than what you're doing when you're just throwing them in, in front of a television set or an iPad or your phone or whatever and saying, here, watch this um, versus you know, what I'm saying like, imagine if the if the if the teachers were like, oh, I'll take the easy way out too. you know, why do I have to stand here, yell with the kids, they're not paying attention, because they're too used to getting the 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 negative. I to me, I see that as a negative practice at home. And then now we're having to deal with it as teachers, right? But yes, when you're enforcing, when you're yes. enforcing the hard way, so to speak, the fruit of it is good. In the long run, would you say is more positive through your experience? Oh, absolutely. Even neurological science has proved it, but you won't see that because businesses don't want you to see that. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Susan Greenfield, neuroscientist out of UK, has some excellent books and excellent examples and TED Talks, a very witty person on uh, mind change, the neural circuits, especially in young children, how they're changed completely if they're exposed to this, how their von Economo neurons never fully develop mm. if they're exposed too early. And I, I, I don't put it as it's hard. I say, do you want the healthy option for your children or the unhealthy option? Mm -hmm. You know, because uh, eating well too, it doesn't have to be hard. It just has to be 
pay attention to what you're buying or what you're growing and how mm-hmm. you're finding food groups. It's the same, except for it's for their brain and on a spiritual level, it's for their spirit. Because once they see some of those images, they can't unsee them, especially as young children. Mm-hmm. And the yeah. imprint, the imprinting is so. We know now from the jihadi generations, we know if, you know, you can imprint, I'm very sorry, that just went off. You can um, imprint in a positive way, and uh, people may not understand it, you know, the, like the Shaolin, those children, and that's thousands of years old, very healthy, incredible society I was privileged to be with for a while, but no, there's no TV, there's no... Um, iPads. There's no. There's a basketball court. There's ping pong courts. They do kung fu. You know, it's and they're healthy, happy, productive, mm-hmm. capable children. Um, and so it's much harder for teachers as well, but also in the society. In a society like in the United States, many of the school buses. As soon as they get on the school bus, there's actually cartoon movies playing. So. They get, even if at home they didn't have it, by the time they get to school after 30 minutes, they're already zombie-eyed. Yeah, yeah. In the dentist office, in the medical clinics, in the, you know, the malls, there's screen screens everywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's, yeah. it, it is challenging for parents to keep the, especially young children before puberty. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. if you want to indoctrinate a child, we can talk about this too, because that's also part of my specialty. If you want to indoctrinate a child in anything, both healthy or unhealthy. They always know, even Kipling said, bring me a child before the age of seven and I'll bring you the man. You know, I'm, wow. it, it's, uh, they make them consumers for life. That's part of the agenda of businesses to have these Chromebooks and everything in schools. Mm-hmm. And associate it with learning, with nurturing in a way, with fun instead of human beings. Mm-hmm. Have you ever seen that that uh, video of this young boy? I don't know how old he is. He's maybe, I don't know, like 11, 12, something like that. And he's on a school bus and he's the only one that does not have a smartphone. And the bus driver gets a heart attack. And he's the only one that notices because all the other kids are with their heads into their phone. And so he ran and saved the whole, all the kids on the bus because he ran, helped the, the driver, put his foot on the brake, slowed the bus to a halt, like steered, like the whole thing, like the kids are tall hero. And I did. Yes. have you seen that? Yes, I have. And he's steering this little boy who's trying to, yes. Right. Yes. And, and, I th- and I thought when I saw that, to me, it really convicted me of look at the results of what your child could be if you if you chose not to give in to what everyone else does because that's the reality is that basically 90 plus percent of the parents that's what they're doing and you have to go against the stream you have to be that kid who you're being made fun of you have to be that parent that you're not being made fun of right because now you're adults but it's like oh you know like you know are you judging me right for do it right either they, they they do the are you judging me kind of attitude or well that's nice you know like talk to me and like when they turn whatever right because your kid isn't at the age of and so they they just think it's like a phase or whatever and and um so yeah so both for parents or for the child obviously there's social uh going to be a social uh struggle so to speak but when i saw that i was just like you know what even if all the you know all the kids in my in in, in my kids um, if all the kids in my kids uh, age group right as they're growing up and whatever take issue of that then then that's going to be something that that I will at least as a as a parent be like hey let me show you something you know and and say do you want to be that kid who saved all the other kids who thought that that their parents thought they're smarter do you want to be the hero or do you want to be the one that just joins the band the ban and is like everyone else and 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 literally your bus is is heading towards impending doom um and and no one to save you no one to to step in and to be the one to me it's it's also similar to the world that i live in with with uh, security 
you know, and, and being situationally aware and, and trained and so on, right? Um, oh, speaking about situationally aware, and I, yeah. I, I even yeah. saw it when I was in Israel in a number of countries in Iraq, you know, right right at the end of the tail end in the of, of uh, Dash of uh, the ISIS <clears throat> massacres. And I was in the Christian area because I taught at the Catholic University there in Arbil and worked near Mosul in another program, um, that the, the security guards, well, I saw it on base in HKI and other places. Security guards are, they're, mm-hmm. <laughs> they're mm-hmm. the phone. Yep, yep. You know, you can't be situationally aware when you have that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what I mean. It's pervasive now, except in certain societies, which have very strict rules. Uh, you could say the Mennonites, for example, the Shaolin in Borneo, the Iban Bedayu there. But even there in Borneo, I was there before they got cell phones into the jungle there on the Indonesian border. And then during the transition and I left when they were already installed, it only took them about five or six months. And you could already see the difference in society starting to break down a bit because of wow. the influence. Yeah, that short a time. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. But even yeah. even now, our vernacular is, I'll show my kids this on what? A screen, a laptop? <laughs> right, right. right? Um, yeah. Because I think a lot of people are no longer confident in their storytelling skills or they feel like mm. their children aren't going to be able to listen. Why is that also? Because the imagination for many children in many parts of the world, but definitely not all, I, I would say not even half the world, uh, we in the West forget that or don't know about that, is uh, their imagination has been parametered already. Mm. I, I sort of joke that their their dreams are already commercially sponsored. You know, what's authentic? <laughs> what's authentic to them anymore? I, yeah. I really hear them. That's why I'm still in this field. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned earlier about your husband and your son, and I know that was very, uh, you know, tragic, obviously for you. And, and it must have impacted you in a very, very strong way. Um, how would you say that helped you be able to handle or deal with the, the world that you live in, so to speak, in your work of going to these foreign countries, um, stepping out of your comfort zone, um, so how did it build you, I guess, on the one hand, but also how were you able to overcome that trauma? Because even though it's not a war trauma, right? Because a lot of people think of PTS as uh, war related only. Uh, I don't think that's the case. I think you can get PTS from a lot of different uh, traumas in your life, right? From a lot of different venues. And um, can you talk about that a little bit? And if you notice, I called it PTS and without the D, because I'm so uh, um, in I, many countries they call it P, uh, post-traumatic reactions rather than post-traumatic stress disorder, and that's more good. accurate. Yeah, exactly. Because I don't like the disorder. Because to me, it's not a disorder. It's like, hello, excuse me. I was perfectly healthy and normal beforehand. <laughs> Still the healthy, normal human being, um, but obviously with with uh, an impact. So why don't you talk about that a little bit? Yes, and um, I've written two, I've written lots of uh, articles and they are online, they're on my website, uh, including in peer reviewed for those, peer reviewed for those who feel that's important. Um, and I wrote them so most people can understand them about post-trauma. Post-trauma mm-hmm. was my specialty in uh, Chinese medicine. Mm-hmm. And I did, uh, one of my rotations at, I don't know if it's still in existence, at Bar Yaakov uh, Hospital um, for people who were considered uh, some of them mentally insane, uh, but a lot of them just had post-trauma reactions. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a life that was had quite a bit of trauma. I had been a victim of violence. I had been uh, or I'll say a survivor of violence. I like to put it that way now. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I had also been subjected to some specialized programs at Georgetown. I talk about it in 
my newest nonfiction book. I can talk about it now. It's far enough away from that time. Subjected mm -hmm. to programs which used, deliberately used, uh, trauma and other methods uh, mm -hmm. to um, enhance your skills from compartmentalization and thresholds of pain. Mm -hmm. And, um, but there's all different kinds of pain in life. And sometimes, you know, I talk to God and say, oh, please, you know, <laughs> no more. Um, it's not just, and for people, especially in Israel, in Ukraine, in places that have terrible violence and generational violence and come from people who've experienced violence over the centuries as well. You know, there's epigenetics carrying trauma in your family, witness to trauma, not necessarily having it happen to you. I know I've had that happen with me as I didn't think that I would have so many reactions just by being a witness to terrible things. Um, but you can, that can also, especially if you feel like you should have helped, but you couldn't help. Mm -hmm. or, uh, Survivor's guilt and all that. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a trauma reaction in your physiological body as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was fortunate because um, my uh, some of my family members on my father's side, my, my grandmother uh, was a physicist that worked with Enrico Fermi in Italy um, during the beginning of World War, or right before World War II. Uh, Enrico Fermi very famous nuclear physicist that came to the United States, Jewish man. Um, she worked on that team. Um, you have to understand this is in the late 20s, early 30s. And she had some pretty, uh, she was a, an amazing woman, but she had some quite some trauma in her life. And her daughter, my father's older sister, they're all passed on now, uh, Laura Dell, she became a psychologist she had had some trauma early in her life. <laughs> um, and when I had trauma in my life, they advised me. They, not only through faith, but also, I do think it's very important that you have people around you. And I do think Israel is one of the strongest mm -hmm. nations, no matter who tries to divide them or internally or externally. But that uh, even when I worked on the kibbutz, I remember uh, someone on our team had cut off their finger accidentally we're working in the Beth ship making um, transmitter parts. That's back in the 70s, so didn't have health and safety. Went with her, <laughs> <laughs> definitely didn't. Went to uh, with her to the uh, sort of clinic there, nurse. And um, her attitude was, you know, she patched her up and said, okay, go back to work. And she said, uh, but at first she was, she was sort of teasing going, oh, well, you have nine more. You can, you can go back to work. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Oh, and uh, no. <laughs> so with, with the children there, especially then, kibbutzim were different now, but especially then, you know, on, on border kibbutzes, kibbutz Ilat, kibbutz Baram, in the early 70s and mid 70s, um, they were just taught to be resilient. You can teach that. There's a muscle for that. If you don't, I'm not saying not to be sympathetic, especially with young children or empathetic, but there's a point where, and, and to a certain extent, my, my husband would do that with my children about height and things. I used to have my heart would go flutter. And he, would mm -hmm. say, and he said, if you teach them to be afraid of this, they'll be afraid of this. If you teach them, mm -hmm. they, can deal with it, they can deal with it, right? Cool. So um, yeah. we did do that. Maybe too much for my daughter and her husband, base jumpers. But um, <laughs> I, they are. <laughs> in addition to the other things that they do. Um, yeah. So that's part of it. Um, I was fortunate because I was in these special programs and then later on I was in another, I, I credit um, therapy from a very, uh, very good Greek um, psychiatrist, Dr. Charles Sakharides, who my aunt knew early in my life and his family had gone through the uh, war with the Turks or something. I mean, you know, People can pass on, maybe um, that can be one of the benefits that people who have been affected, I was told that, and I think it's true, is that once you navigate through it, that you, um, I don't wanna say cure, you don't cure, you heal 
somebody, I'm using analogy, somebody said once, it's the arrows went in. And if you walk around with the arrows, you don't pull them out, the arrows are going to keep everybody and things away from you because you're walking around with these arrows. The only way that it can heal is you have to pull them out. That's going to hurt. And there's still going to be a scar there, but you're no longer walking around with those arrows. Mm -hmm. And I look at trauma like that because I had one kind of trauma in my life and then I had another kind of trauma in my life. And yeah, I, I thought, oh, most people say, okay, this is the trauma you got. At one point, somebody tried to strangle me. They didn't luckily succeed in certain things. You know, I, violence, that's one kind. You raped, that's another. You mm -hmm. see somebody killed next to you, very good friend, roommate, teammate, that's another. Even in medicine, you know, there, mostly in Chinese medicine, you don't deal with real, you know, right away traumas, but I treated some of the first Iraqi and Afghani refugees to New, Ze New Zealand in the 2003. And sometimes just seeing them and um, their wounds or healing of their wounds, or sometimes they had pictures of what happened. You know, um, some people get very affected just by that. Uh, some people can't be around blood. Some people, if something happens to their child, that's the most traumatic for them. And mm -hmm. um, I do think a lot of people think it's only if you're in a quote unquote war zone, but Believe me, having lived in New York City before Giuliani was there and other places in the world, Karachi, you know, just living in certain cities is like a war zone. Mm -hmm. And um, the constant stress of always having to be on guard against criminal networks. And uh, so people have to be a little bit easier in their, con I, I don't even call it judgment, I just call it condemnation. They'll go, oh, well, that wasn't that bad. Well, for that person, maybe it was that bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the other hand, there's the other part of um, people using it to be entitled to benefits and things. I don't think that's right either. Mm -hmm. I do think you have to take a certain amount of personal accountability and be able to do the work. And what I see when I see some documentaries, and um, I think I sent one to you, of what happened to some of the Yazidi children. People want to forget about what happened to the Yazidis and Christians in Iraq, Kurdistan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Imad's childhood, made by the German documentary, how it takes so much. These children were taken away for one to two years and what happened to them and how it takes 24-7. It doesn't take once a week going to therapy. It takes everybody to try and help just one child. Mm -hmm. And pills and, and a lot of things that the... American VA would give people, you know, that can be a stopgap sometimes. It's absolutely necessary, but then the side effects from that can be just as bad. Mm. So I, I'm a person can only talk about my direct experience, which is with hundreds of patients in different places and with myself and uh, with some of my teammates and, and uh, organizations I'm with, with veterans, I've seen how it can help, but it takes work. Is mm -hmm. You know, uh, it takes a lot of work first to pull that arrow out and then to heal it. Yeah. And, uh, but, I, but you're you're basically saying that pills is not the solution. And I think a good way to, to for people to also understand um, being medicated for your problem is that the medicine doesn't make the scar go away. Right. The medicine doesn't make a way that that it doesn't do away with, you know, the 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 arrow and after it being pulled out or or the arrow is there. Right. For the analogy. But you take the pill so you don't feel the arrow, but the arrow is still in you. <laughs> it's like you didn't you didn't deal with the problem. And um, I noticed uh, a talk that. Um, uh, the Jordan Peterson was uh, talking about. There was a kind of a aha uh -huh moment for me of, oh, wow, that's cool. I like that. He mentioned that a lot of the people he deals with that have gone through trauma, they want to run away from the experience, right? Escapist, whatever. And he goes, no, no, no. You want to, you want to heal? You're going to have to confront your demons, basically. You're going to have to confront and go back to that, that or, or revisit. I, I forget exactly how he put it, 
but you have to you have to confront it. You can't ignore it. You can't go away from it. And um, so so you're you're kind of, I guess, in line with kind of that train of that same kind of school of thought, if you will, that I guess to 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 heal from trauma, would you say you have to actually uh, confront it or confront what you'd been through, not try to escape from it? All right. I can go from my own personal point of view, which some people will definitely not agree with. Sure. And that's all right. Um, as societies have gotten so big and the quote unquote medical system has become so corporate and so extensive and education too. It, it becomes a one size fits all or um, the general, you heal from trauma by doing this. No, I really still believe it's very individual. Mm. And I believe for some people, as I say, maybe for some part of the time, a pharmaceutical drug may be appropriate for part of that process. Mm. You also um, have what's called medicines now. And I believe that's a correct term for what they use for, from plants, which uh, contain psychedelic properties, Sonoran toad medicine from animals that have been known for thousands of years. You have herbs from Chinese and Ayurvedic medicine that have been known and Native American ceremonies that have been known for thousands of years to work on warriors coming back and trauma. Mm -hmm. um, they're not for everyone. And mm -hmm. uh, so to have a range of those, but I think some people are conditioned, especially in Western societies, it's comfort and what's easy and what's fast. But mm -hmm. what's easy and what's fast may not be the most thorough way to heal. It may not be a long-term healing. And it often is one which will mask rather than reveal what the real causes may be. I mean, I know myself. Mm. I, you don't always know, I mean, they're called in English, in, other, in uh, American medical parlance, they're called triggers, but you could say, um, you could also say they're revealers where you thought you were over, let's say, um, no, I'll give a, a personal to most people know, and it was a very public online and uh, misinformation right away within 30 minutes of her assassination, it was completely wrong, put out on all the media. So for my teammate, I continue to say, you know, this was not what, don't believe what you read. <laughs> um, Lisa Marie Akbari, my teammate in Afghanistan that was assassinated uh, in December, 2015, shot in the head there, but for the grace of God go I. But um, I, and then I had to stay afterwards. I describe it in my first book and deal with the fact that a lot of people around me, it, it was an inside job and I didn't know exactly who, but I still had to be there. <laughs> and so that kind of fear, the fear mm -hmm. that, you know, um, sure. but then years later, uh, when I feel, you know, it's not been 10 years yet, but I, I feel the same with my son and my, and his father, my, my ex-husband, um, you think, okay, I'm over that. And then a music will play or um, you'll go to a place that you had been to with them or even a smell or a sound. And then suddenly things will come back you had forgotten. And that will, quote unquote, trigger. But mm -hmm. if you don't get afraid of it and you can journal it or can be with a support group, I think people around you who have been through that with the vets group I'm with, Veterans Exploring Treatment Solutions, which is founded by Amber and Marcus Capone. Excellent, you know, I'm still working with them. That, that can really help you because you are exorcising in a way that which was inside you, bottled up, maybe you didn't even know it, and it's still affecting you, maybe even unconsciously. Mm -hmm. We bring yeah. it to consciousness and it's easier to then really let go. And I will also bring up a lot of people don't want, they're afraid, especially in America, to talk about God. Whatever name you call, whether it's Tankashila, Dio, 
Hashem, Teyarik Inui, Mon Dieu, Allah, whatever you call it, higher than yourself. Mm. You know, that, that having that faith and realizing that sometimes you are put in situations. I know I didn't want to go back to Afghanistan after the first time and certain things happened. I ended up going back five times. I didn't think I was going back to Kurdistan. And then, you know, you realize often after you get there or after you come back from there, I was supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to, but I was supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, um, so that's how a lot of my life, you ask how I travel and go to these different places. A lot of times I didn't want to go. <laughs> I mean, even early on in my life when I was asked to help find stolen children from these indigenous tribes in, in um, Australia and North America, especially, and some of the elders would say, you know, you're the person that's supposed to do this. We see that you're this person supposed to do this. And I go, no, I think you you must be wrong. It, it's not me. I don't mm -hmm. want to do this, right? Yeah, uh, and, yeah. and I can look back and say, yes, I, I was supposed to do that, even though it ended up being very difficult for me and my family at times. Sure. Um, so I think for many people, if they... And, you know, October 7th and, and the other intifadas and, uh, well, the massacres throughout history of the Jewish people and the massacres of the Christian people and the Yazidis and the Druze and so many people who are targeted. Yeah. Um, if they have a faith, I also think that's a medicine. It's more than a medicine, but if you want to put it in what's, what can help cure, heal, heal mm -hmm. that's a big component that's often disregarded in these government clinics. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a teammate who who deals with uh, post-trauma with um, different uh, groups, not just veterans. Um, and, and actually, it, it, it is the IDF veterans who run the um, the post-trauma, uh, um, how would you say, uh, like there are the staffers, mm -hmm. uh, it's 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 the former military guys, Israeli military guys, and a lot of the people that they uh, help are are not war victims or not not warriors that have been to war, but people who have either been war victims from uh, the Ukraine war and in other conflicts, and so they'll come in and and basically help them right deal with the with with. Uh, you know, to heal with all with, you know, through the, the different uh, stages of, of, of what you can do and, and exercises or what have you and practices. And one of the things that, that, that he told us to our, cause we had a little talk actually with my unit because we had been through <laughs> quite a bit. And, uh, and so we sat down, we discussed all the different things and he said, and, and he pointed out, he said, uh, you know, he's not like a religious Jew. He's not like overtly, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, from from a what you would consider to be a religious person. Mm -hmm. But he pointed out, he says, and if you have faith, like prayer or Bible reading or what have you, that that is part of the process. That is actually something that that, that is recommended by most of the uh, experts in in what we deal with. He said. And I found that really interesting that he pointed that out because I expected a guy who isn't a religious guy in practice, right? But he's saying that, hey, if you're if you have a a, a, a religious faith, that's actually something that you should you should embrace deeper for your process of healing and not mm -hmm. ignore it. Like don't do the opposite. Like if you had a in other words, if you were praying every morning keep that practice if you were you know like don't just stop things because of it because of the you know what you've been through and 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 essentially right you become apathetic you become what have you you, you your hygiene goes down your 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 uh, appetite and all the different uh signs that that you're basically going downhill right mm -hmm. you become so, numb sometimes yeah yeah and become numb exactly I, so I found that interesting. So, so yeah, I mean, it's not like you're the only one saying this, right? Just to kind of strengthen this uh, point that you made about faith, um, because that's also something that I uh, will talk about on this podcast 
even though I don't want to make it a main emphasis because I know a lot of people get queasy when you talk about faith. Um, <laughs> but but that's a that's a fact, right? These are scientific facts. The way I see it is that when people in your field and in his field are are saying this and they're repeating these same uh, advices, and these are non-religious people, makes you wonder a little bit, right? It makes you think <laughs> that. Uh, what and why do you think that is, though? Why do you think that is that that faith actually is a factor in helping you? cope helping you heal he helping you move forward why do you think that is because hmm. that, that made me curious when i heard them make that as a point i know from reading literature and when we study chinese medicine we read the emperor yellow emperor classics and they go back thousands of years first written codified medical system and being with the shaolin um and being with aboriginals, also over 10,000 years old, you know, before we would do the clinics for acupuncture there, they would say certain prayers. It's like putting on, you know, in, in Christianity and others, they'd say the armor of God, but this has been known for thousands of years beforehand in, in many, many different cultures, whether it's singing or praying or um, chanting, or sweat lodges in Ipi, that there's a preparation that you do before you go into war or something very important. And there's a preparation when you come back that you mm. do. And mm. the, when we talk about the resilience training, I mean, I know from the army, the work with the army I did and the work in at HKI and, and, and KC, you know, before you go back to the States, you would have a kind of, AAR sort of uh, after action review of um, it was to check a box to say that they told you what possibly to expect. It, it was a PowerPoint or something, you know, about <laughs> oh, if you have this, if you have this, if this, and everybody's just waiting to get on the bird to go home. And so nobody really right. is paying attention. Right. Call this just, number if you're desperate. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, or, you know, or conversely, you know, to go to yeah. a place. Do you have these symptoms? Nobody will put any of them down, right? Exactly. And then exactly. the resilience training is saying to be aware of them. But you, this is what I mean. You can start resilience training with your children and, and in schools. I mean, even to be a substitute teacher, you have to go through now, at least where I am. Well, I think in all of Texas and probably many other schools, um, you have to go through uh, active shooter um, drill training, what to do in active shooter to, mm -hmm. as teachers and to a less extent as students. Mm -hmm. um, and they also don't realize what they're subjecting the children to in a way by the kind of alarmist sometimes training that they do, rather than I see the Shaolin and I saw wow. in, I was in Siberia in 2011-12 in Novosibirsk, there at the, at the technical universities. I stayed right down from the Spetsnaz winter training. <laughs> the place was called the Pentagon, interestingly enough, on Gorsky Adin. And um, <laughs> yeah, and I took Krav Maga down there, the best Krav Maga I ever had. Oh, wow. you know, it's because they don't sugarcoat anything. And they also don't do it, you know, the training is as it's going to be for children as well as for adults. Mm -hmm. The shower train on cement, the Krav Maga, the, there were in some of the training, no mats, right? Mm -hmm. When people, and, and certainly when I've had fines done against me, first of all, it's not one person. <laughs> it's often more than one. And it's usually not on a place where there's any mats. It's usually you're going to be on the cement or against a wall or something. You know? So there are ways to train children without alarming them, with making them feel capable. Mm -hmm. so that, and I think in Israel and Ukraine, a place is very important, right? And it's important in yeah. America for criminal gangs and bullying. But oh, yeah. that kind of resilience training um, in America, from what I've seen, does never incorporates God. They're too afraid. Don't you know? You might afraid this religion or that religion. Whereas right. in other countries, in Borneo, everybody prayed before you even went into school, mm -hmm. and, and they were they were um, being attacked by the Islamists there. They were kidnapping their children, taking them away to train them to be suicide bombers. In the wow. Christian, yes, most people don't know about that either. I no, wrote, they don't. Wrote about my first book. 
-hmm. Just like universities for great technical, medical, art, um, literature. Unfortunately, there's universities, training centers in different parts of the world. Uzbekistan, known for its great training of drivers for VBETs, you know, vehicle-borne IEDs. Um, mm -hmm. This is in Pakistan, known for training excellent suicide bombers, both female and male, right? Certain mm -hmm. places in uh, Indonesia, off the coast of the Philippines also, known for training. Yeah, so there's this kind of, there is resilience training. You can start with children earlier on without scaring them, just to make them feel as well capable that if something happens, because, you know, you probably already know, you know, a lot of um, very serious uh, injuries and death can occur because people just either freeze or they get so frenetic. They, they have the opposite of grace under pressure. I, I, I make a funny poem about this in one of my poems. It's called What to Do in a Bunker. It was a real situation in a bunker in Afghanistan um, where, you know, these people just absolutely freaked out. And they were they were going to get us killed by their freak out, right? <laughs> you know? right. And, but you don't know what you're going to do if you don't know what you're going to do. Correct. I'm not saying that even if you're trained, that won't happen. But if you're not trained at all, and right. I I think many of the military in many countries are getting better about this, but uh, there certainly wasn't that kind of training back in 2011 when I went through, mm -hmm. and uh, that is also proven to help. It's just like having a visualization. People use it for the Olympics. They use it for playing in orchestras. You visualize perfectly how you're going to play or how you're going to run. Or, and you visualize that so you have it imprinted in your neural circuits. This is the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. it may not happen exactly that way, but you've already imprinted the positive before you play a wrong note or you trip over a hurdle or... And then you also keep imprinting, keep revealing um, plan A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. Maybe you only have plan A. Oh, okay, that's already gone. And maybe plan B is gone. I've been in such a situation. Whereas, and then also, what if you have to come up with something that requires your full spectrum thinking, which a lot of children and young, a lot of people in the world don't have. Mm -hmm what to do outside the box. Okay, you've been trained this, but nothing that you've been trained for is happening. So what do you do? Mm -hmm. A lot of people, I think they call it, I don't know if all these jar, these jargon abbreviations are still in, but I think used to call it OBE, overcome by events. And they just give up. Overcome by events. <laughs> yeah, I've heard it as fog of war yeah. um, and, and so on. And I think, you know, this is a really good point because it's also re relevant for like the type of stuff that you do in combat and or special forces uh, uh, units, which is the next level up, right? That there is the training you to the point where it becomes automatic. But then when you go more into the special forces realm, it's like you pointed out, you have the plan A, the plan B, the plan C, but then there's the, there was no plan for this, you know? Mm -hmm. And now you have to think outside the box and that's really what you're looking for in a good uh, special forces operator is someone who, who is not going to freak out when, wait, there was no contingency for this scenario, you know? And then they just give up, right? Because Oh, I wasn't trained for this, <laughs> you know. And then you turn around and you leave, and it's like, no, 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 no. no. I mean, no, you got it. Like, <laughs> yeah, like you, no, no. You're you are you are the person on point here. There is no contingency. And we have a joke in my unit. Um, we have a, a saying: "No one's coming for you." Like you, you're it. Like there's no one go coming to to rescue you. Like you are the we are the rescue. Like we are the like this is it. <laughs> And, and, um, and so we kind of joke about that, right? That, that, that we have this mindset in, in my group of guys that we're not expecting, we're not looking for the Marines, right? To bail us out of this hairy situation, right? 
So like our mindset is hey, you're it. <laughs> so if something happens, you know, you got to you got to overcome. You got to overcome. You got to find a way through this uh, obstacle, this impossibility, whatever it may be. And um, you're right. And, and I think this is also something I teach my kids, right? Um, when they're complaining or whatever about, you know, whatever, whatever I'm trying to get them through. And then I tell them, well, you know, you could just be like everybody else and just give up. You know, you can just be like everybody else and, 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 you know, or you, if you want to be like daddy, right. You want to be better, right. You want to excel. Well, then you, you're, this is, this is something you're going to have to go through when it's something they don't like, when it's something they don't want to do. Right. Uh, is what I mean. And, and, and so I try to, to bring it down to, well, if you just give up on this hurdle right now, the small hurdle in their life, that that's the big challenge. You're going to give up on the next thing and the next thing and next thing. So if, if I'm wanting you to overcome this hurdle, there's a, there's a reason and a rhyme behind it. And, um, and, and it's also something that I tell at a lot of churches that I go to, right. Where I speak and, and I say, you know, the sad thing is that, that a lot of what I hear from churches is that the pastors don't ever want to talk about anything negative. They only want to talk about how great and good God is. And you're not going to experience any hurt or pain. And I say, you know, I've traveled to Africa where Christians get butchered, you know, mutilated, like what happened to us on October 7th. Like that's the kind of stuff that happens to them. Your message, sir, with all due respect, wouldn't work for them. You know, you basically prepare, prepare them for failure. If you don't prepare people for those contingencies and for the worst possible scenario, like any place I walk into, my mind is constantly thinking of like what you said, plan A, plan B, plan C, and worst case scenario, well, <laughs> you better have a, you know, hopefully I can think on my feet in this, in, in that scenario. But you know what I mean? Like It's like when you set people up to failure, to in my opinion, when you don't give them challenges to overcome, when you just, you know, because they complain or you know how humans are. Yes. To me, that's, that is the biggest fail to them. Right. Especially if you're the one guiding them through that, that uh, process. Yes. And it also does come back to faith because as you point out, and, and this was a, a challenge for us, some of us and some of my faculty members who had, they'd all survived the Sage of Daesh. I, I won't go into what they survived, but mm -hmm. You also, when people say, oh, you know, you've been through so much, you, you know, you're losing your son and, and, but I've been around people who have lost so much more and there are so many worse ways to die than on a mountain, you know, um, mm -hmm. it puts it in perspective. But the other part is that some of the bishops, especially in the United States, not, not in Iraq, but also, um, you know, in different countries would be saying, oh, you must turn the other cheek turn the other cheek to what they've just been doing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so they'll do it again uh, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um and also uh there are some books that i'd read earlier on in my life i i was a really voracious leader, reader on these um don't read them so much anymore but this one i still remember uh called the gift of fear and mm -hmm. it, I don't know if you've read it, but it, it talks about certain, um, and also I had very good trainers uh, when I was in the judo club in Georgetown, ex-Marines from, it was Vietnam era, so they were pretty tough guys. Um, just different kinds of training that would come back into my mind, even when I was in the performing arts or, you know, not necessarily in a place that I thought would be a uh, violent place, but even though um, people might say, oh, that doesn't apply to me or I don't need that. Once in a while, that's just why I believe in God's guiding hand is many times I would say, really, do I have to go to this training? I'm in this aspect, not this aspect, including I had to go through this IT training, uh, which was a precursor to Palantir, which you know later on I realized, oh, well, thank goodness I went through that. Um, yeah. You, you, you have to, your children, if you can, I always had grandparents, fortunately, especially, and big extended family, not so much my parents, but especially my extended family, 
education, education, education. And mm -hmm. even if it's a course you miss, might not like that it's required, find a way to learn something from it. Mm -hmm. Even if you learn what not to do. Mm -hmm. um, and if those are imprinted before someone is 25 neurologically, I mean, it's much stronger. It can happen later, of course. But that's why the adversarial groups want the children too. Mm -hmm. because, you know, if they can turn them into little zombie suicide bombers and haters, that's going to be very hard to untune. Very let's, hard. Let, let's let's d dive into that actually a little bit because one of the things that I've said from my experience of 10 months of fighting in Gaza right now through or in contrast to being in Gaza back in 2004 before the pullout, that was the last time I was fighting in Gaza. Um, what I point out from my personal observation, and, and I really hope I'm wrong, and I really hope that the personal observation of many of the men that I've run into that have the exact same repeated uh, uh, observation, by the way, so so I know it's just not it's not just me. And and it is a and it is a hard and sad thing to say is that our experience is that there is no innocence in Gaza. Now, what I mean by that is just to unpack that. I'm not saying that every person in Gaza is is a is a terrorist, right, or 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 warmonger. Um, but what I am saying is that what I have seen is that the propaganda and brainwashing of these children at the schools and at the homes being being enforced more and so on, right? And in the society, that there are certain norms that they're being taught that is making them into essentially zombies, yep. right? Like terror zombies, yes. where either you become a, a full-fledged terrorist and that's like the highest ideal and you're the hero of the of the of the of, of your neighborhood and, and whatever in your community, or uh, you at least support them. So either digging the tunnels, bringing the terrorist food, supporting them, letting them sleep at your house, uh, aiding and abetting, you name it, right? I mean, the, the four hostages that were rescued, for example, were rescued from an Al Jazeera reporter. And the, I believe the father is a, is a imam and, and a doctor or something like that. If mm -hmm. I remember correctly, wealthy, wealthy family, well, to, well to do. Um, but they weren't gun toting terrorists. The ones who were guarding the facility was the Hamas operatives who were guarding the, the, the home that had the hostages held there. These high value uh, hostages that uh, in their hands. So all that to say, right, that. Um, what have you seen to that effect of what I've experienced in of what I've experienced, and is that is there any truth behind that observation? Would you say, or am, are, are we just out to lunch, so to speak? Right? No, I'll, I'll start on a personal level because many of these networks and T organizations, whether it's in Afghanistan, Pakistan, criminal organizations, cartels, Vorizikoni and the Soviets. Um, I mean, I grew up in an anti-mafia family, but my, my grandparents lived in a maf mafia neighborhood. We call it connected, a connected neighborhood, okay? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I think that's also my experiences in New York early on and later in my life, going navigating through neighborhoods. I mean, I lived on the, on the for eight years as a young adult in my early 20s. I lived on the border of Chinatown in Little Italy and not so far was the garment district in East Village. You know, each place had a different culture mm -hmm. and it was dangerous in those times if you weren't, especially if you weren't from the neighborhood or didn't went in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather who taught, my grandparents taught him um, public schools, Brooklyn public schools. My grandfather, Sicilian man, was from a part of Sicily that is known for very ruthless part of the mafia. He was not, uh, and my uncle, my father's brother, prosecuted them in New York. Uh, but uh, this is what I mean by resilience, too. I mean, I was always taught, especially by my grandfather, my grandparents, you know, you don't even give one fingernail 
My, my father had done something when he was young that he got punished for, that this story was a story to tell, you know, before mm -hmm. moving, see, is that he had, been offered, he had been offered money. He had a bicycle in the neighborhood. I guess he got it when he was 14 or something, moved to America. And somebody had approached him, said, you can make money with that bicycle. All you have to do is take this, uh, I guess it was an envelope or something to these people, and and uh, then we'll give you money. Anyway, so he didn't, I, maybe he didn't think to tell his parents or whatever. And but anyway, he didn't tell his parents. Um, and suddenly he had money to buy candy and other things. Right? And uh, my grandparents noticed, where are you getting this money? Mm -hmm. And then he told them, oh, well, I'm making money. Uh, I'm a courier. What are you a courier for? You know, this is not conducted in English, but I'm saying it in English. And uh, then when my grandfather found out, oh, he was, oh, he was just absolutely furious. And he took, he said, you're giving all the money back. He took my father to the house of uh, this particular family that lived very, very close. And luckily, because my grandfather was a teacher in the public schools and they had some respect in those days, and he was a man of honor, you know, uh, he didn't get involved. Uh, you know, they let him off, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that story sticks with me. I pass it on. It's like, and then my grandfather told us as well, you don't give one fingernail to these people because you can't make a deal with the devil. Yeah. You exactly. are, they, they lie. They're, they're going to come back. And you don't, it's not just you. You get your whole family involved. Mm-hmm. Had a certain portion of our family. I love this cousin very much. Both cousins are, are dead, and but um, they were shunned because this great aunt had married in maybe unwittingly. Because a lot of people marry unwittingly into these networks. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're targeted. They don't know. Maybe they're targeted because of their beauty or their connections or whatever. And once you're in, you're never out. There's only one way out. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I had this lesson imprinted upon me as the eldest all my life. And I used it and I saw the similarities in many places I've been where there are these networks, but especially among, I'll say it, Islamist extremist groups, mm -hmm. whether it be in Pakistan or Afghanistan, Saudi, Qatar, I worked in Qatar, uh, Chechnyans coming over to Iraq, you know, I mean, there's, there's one, they're not hidden about their agenda and they're, they're very effective, more effective in many ways than the, other, than the other ideologies about being able, because they now have the benefit of years of study and what goes around comes around because America, unfortunately, hosted a lot of the worst torture training um, courses, just like I said, there's university courses for whether they be drivers for V-beds or torturers. Well, we had the, I forget what it was called, the Uni University of the Americas or the College of the Americas, where they taught all the South American Pinochet and those people all the worst ter ter tactics to use, the, for the police to use. Well, they, a lot of them learned it in America, you know. Mm. So, you know, um, and now you have the internet where they don't even have to have Although some of the patients that I treated that were refugees from Iraq, you know, when you're treating people, sometimes you'll ask them about one. It's for, I'll just give a brief example. I know I'm talking a long time, but um, you'll, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll ask, um, uh, okay, do you smoke? Some of these um, refugees, do you smoke? Yes. How long? Have, and this person is maybe 19 or 20. How long have you been smoking? Uh, since I was six or seven, since we were six or seven, okay, you know, you write it down, and then you're going through, and then you notice that they have uh, were evidently bu bullet wounds, let's say, in the back of their legs. This is based on a real case, not exactly, and um, and they're quite long term, you know. And this person's only nineteen or twenty, and you say, so uh, okay, so what? And they won't tell you sometimes. Did you have any injuries? No, I'm fine. <laughs> and then you go, well, wait, what are these? Oh yeah, I got shot. When was that? <laughs> when, I, when I was seven. Crazy. Okay, what happened? Da da da. And oh yes, that's when I started smoking because they didn't have any painkillers, so they just gave me a cigarette to smoke. You know. Oh man. Um, yeah, I, I just have you know people will 
tell you firsthand from their injuries, some of the things that have happened to them. And, um, but I don't think people have had a fairly normal, comfortable life can ever really understand the depth of a combination of fear-based trauma combined with the ideology that God tells you to do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's, that's why it's different than just criminal networks that people could possibly be bought off with money. Right. Because when the, you yeah. threat that God will either reward you, but more um, concrete to them in many cases, I, you know, from what I've seen and what I've read in the uh, interviews from children whose bombs didn't go off and then they were arrested and can read the transcripts, um, that the fear-based training is a very big part of that. I mean, there is a Palestinian who was the son of one of the leaders who's come forward, Joseph Yosef uh, Haddad. Is it? Um, sorry, if I if I don't have his name. Yeah. Very brave, very brave man who's come back. That yeah. com- combined with this ideology is also very severe tactics, especially. I mean, I, I've also had Afghani women, educated women now, telling me. There's no hope. It's, even when I was in Pakistan, they said, why, why don't you just come and bomb the whole place? Because there's just no hope of changing yeah. society. Um, and uh, talk about post-trauma. People also don't remember about the women and the girls. And they're not seen as the warriors. They're often the most, not only the most complicit, but from firsthand accounts, from the siege of Daesh, ISIS, some of the worst enforcers, the most cruel tactics, either perpetrated by the women or the women egged on the men to do this to children, Christian and Yazidi children and women. Wow. Girls and women trained early on. Now you can say some of them were so threatened, okay, they felt like they had, they had a choiceless choice, they had to do it or their children, but some of them enjoyed it. There are a lot, I mean, there are, there are tactics for training psychopaths, and those tactics have been engineered with all the tech we have now. You 24 hours subject, uh, even as an adult, but certainly children, to making them watch not only videos, but making them watch how to assassinate, starting with dolls, then animals, then real people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That neurologically changes them. Can you unchange it? Nobody's really been successful in doing it. I'm not certainly not on a broad scale. You might see certain examples and you might see that documentary on Emad's childhood on there, how they're progressing. Mm-hmm. But that was only made a few years ago. So we really don't know. The imprinting can be so deep that the yeah. child as an adult doesn't even know later on that something triggers them and they're going to go do some violence against mm-hmm. some X, Y, Z. It's so. Diff- a criminal networks in that sense. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's a good point that you pointed out. And that's something I try to also explain and, and make a comparison that, you know, I, that's funny because I, I, I make a similar comparison with criminal networks and say, like, look, these people are into it because of family, because uh, they came from broken family. So they found a family in the criminal network or be- so it's so it's belonging. Right. Or because of uh, incentive, if it was financial, right? Like, you know, you take the little the little envelope of a little bit of money and before you know it, there, you know, that envelope of money gets, you know, thicker and thicker, but so do the, the, so does the delivery that they expect of you, right? So in other words, you have to sell your soul more and more every time they pay you more and more and so on and so forth, right? So, it's a downward spiral, but you can get out of it because you can wake up and realize, okay, where is this leading? Um, but then there's the fear factor of, well, I can't just walk away from this particular group because if I do, there is no walking away. And so there's a similarity there too with these terrorist groups. But ultimately, ultimately, the worst thing uh, on top of all of that, of all the why should I walk away from this path of destruction, right, is the faith factor. And so to me, that combination is the most 
destructive combination, like you pointed out, because I see it as like <laughs> your whole world view, faith and the community that you're part of is combined. There is no coming out of that, except for the gentleman that you mentioned, Musab Hassan Yusuf, who's uh, the, the son of one of the founders of Hamas. And the re and his aha moment where he woke up and realized this path that we're on is leading nowhere was when that he saw the different terrorist faction groups slaughtering each other in prison. That was his aha moment of if this is truth, if this is Allah, if this is where everything I've been brought up and, and, and believed to believe is, is truth is leading to, it's just leading to, to, to murder and destruction. Like this is, you know, and that was his moment of, of kind of like, whoa. And um, I actually spent a period of time as uh, being uh, with my uh, soldiers in the same prison that he stayed at, actually, that he was imprisoned at. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we were, uh, during my military service in the early days, that was one of my stops, so to speak. And it was uh, something I don't ever want to go back to. Uh, doing security for these high, high, high uh, inmates, high, uh, what do you call it? Terrorists, dangerous. right? Yeah. yeah, very dangerous criminals, right? I mean, it was a miserable place, you know, just to, to be around. And, and I witnessed what he writes about in his book. Uh, I think either the Green Prince or, or Son of Hamas is the name of the book, Son of Hamas. But he was labeled the Green Prince by the Shabak. Uh, uh, that had uh, used him to thwart many, many terrorist attacks. So, so yeah. So you're basically saying then that that what we're witnessing is is uh, as what I call these terrorist zombies. It's 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 a true reality, unfortunately. Yes, I. You know, in my heart, I have tremendous pity. Um, not empathy, but but pity for mm. children who have been subjected to this, have no choice. They were born into this. Yeah. They've been so traumatized. And a lot of them, I do have a two-part series called Jihadi Generation, Strategies Used for Weaponizing Children, which I wrote mm -hmm. over five years ago, published in Small Wars Journals, which deep, goes into details and specific examples. I... You know, in your heart, you can say, especially, you know, someone is 10 or 11 coming towards you, you go, I, it's not your fault, but mm -hmm. it's not a hyena's fault going after your throat either. Are, <laughs> are you, are you going to let them, are you yeah. going to let them go into the school with your children? Yeah. When they themselves don't know when they might, through no fault of their own, but it is, that's why I say it's, they're like walking Tomba and the it, the hmm. techniques for doing this to children are getting better, quote unquote, better and better. They're getting more um, effective because hmm. they use drugs now. They use lots of um, indoctrination with videos, with electroshock, with shock and awe, sort of uh, you know, on real people that they have to do. And then also, if a child has any kernel left in them of, let's say, love from their parents or consciousness of what good and bad is, that's why they want to take the children before they're seven. Mm -hmm. to but if they, you know, let's say they have something left in them, mm -hmm. often they'll want to kill themselves rather than continue. So they'll go ahead. They feel like, okay, I'll be... Shahid, I'll go ahead. I'll, I'll die rather than keep on going and doing this, mm -hmm. or be subjected to violence, rape, humiliation, making them do terrible things. Yeah, and so from their point of view, that's the better way out. Mm -hmm. Isn't that tragic? I mean, for me personally, I have no problem fighting to defend my country and 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 going after the terrorists and all that what i find to be tragic is just knowing that they have successfully raised the generation through these techniques that you mentioned that is basically damning a whole generation it's more than two generations now 
Yeah. I mean, damning them. I mean, just damning them, right? Essentially, you're, you're, they're, they're damning them because, like you said, they're, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're locked into that worldview. And you said before seven, I know for a fact that they raise these children with this indoctrination as young as two, as, as two years old, is, 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 is where they can say their first words, you know. Um, it's it's so young, so young. Yeah, and, and that's uh, that is so tragic to me. That is so tragic. It's evil. It's it's uh, you know the world is 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 okay with calling out the Nazis, right? And and don't feel any queasiness about it. When you look at this terrorist organization that's taken over the Gaza Strip, I hope. People are aware of the fact these guys, in my book, are worse than the Nazis by far. Well, correct me if I'm wrong on that, in your opinion. Oh, and um, I talked about it a little bit in my first book, and and uh, I know it's not my fault, and even my husband wasn't fully aware of the extent of his parents and families Nazis background, but I inadvertently, you'd say, married into absolute Nazi family. Mm -hmm. That the grandmother, my Marty's mother, was part of the Mädchen with uh, the young maidens for Hitler, and his father was uh, part of the Sundance SS, a lot of their families in Argentina. They tried mm -hmm. to hide it, but we found out. And... Um, which this is what I mean. You can marry into both ways, not be realizing that you've done mm -hmm. this. Correct. Uh, and it's not that it makes the Nazi, this, the mindset is the same. This is what, it's just the techniques have become so much more effective. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at Lenny Reifenstahl's movies triumph of the will and how and look at the faces of the regular people there mm -hmm. they are absolutely zombified too right 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 mm -hmm. they had social media and the kind of drugs i mean they tried you know they did the experiments with the drugs and they did the experiments on real people and um they completely dehumanized races of people and and religions and cultures of people and they also did it with God. They mm -hmm. did a satanic as well, perversion of God using the Tibetan symbols and esoterics, but they believed in spirituality for the dark side, for the mm -hmm. Lucifer side, if you will. Ma hadash tachad hashemesh, en hadash tachad hashemesh, nachon? You know what I mean? In some ways, unfortunately, there's aspects of human nature that have been exacerbated. There's also, positive parts of human nature as well. I mean, we're talking about what has to be dealt with because this is a battle in all, all realms, spiritual, physical, for the next generations, very important. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, however, there are also a lot of very positive strategies being used. I mean, and I also don't like to always talk about strategies that are effective for the other side because these days, the other side's listening too. Uh, exactly. <laughs> you know, That's right. Your, sure. Right. Um, and it's the same with, you know, going against people who are trafficking children. And a lot of that is just for money. Mm -hmm. But, but mm -hmm. who's allowed that industry to grow? We have to ask ourselves, who has allowed that industry to grow? Yeah. yeah. Um, and what it's done to the children who were trafficked, who then they become the enforcers for the next generation. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is what I mean. People want to say, ah, uh, that's just too dark. I don't want to deal with it. It's mm -hmm. gotten to the point where everybody, I believe, in their own way, even if it's just a light in their own family, training their children to be resilient in their own way, saying no to certain things, you know? No. And, and also, uh, it's a kind of a Catholic term, but, you know, to teach them to stay away from the occasion of temptation. If you mm -hmm. don't go to certain places, if you go to certain places, you guarantee not that you're going to succumb or be part of that, but most likely it's going to be very hard to say no if you're not a really strong character. And maybe if you go those places and say no, you're going to be in trouble. 
So just mm -hmm. at all possible, teach them not to go to those places. Mm -hmm. um, but if they don't know what those places are, you know, I, I was working in anti-gang in both New York and in Denver. We had mm -hmm. serious problems with gangs in Denver and, of course, New York. And uh, uh, what shocked me is when I found out some of the tactics, and one of the tactics was they would triangulate the gang members, both neo-Nazi and other gangs, and there were neo-Nazi gangs in Denver. They would triangulate out of uh, near health food stores, <laughs> you know, and places like that where they would notice, and they were they were better skilled than most intel people. They would notice who's coming, whose who's teenagers are going in by themselves, how they walk, are they walking dejected? Do they have their own car? Is there anybody around? And then they, they'd start identifying their targets. Uh, do they like this kind of girl, right? Then they'd get their own criminal network, gang network girls to drive up in a car that that guy would like, invite him to a party. He had mm -hmm. no idea. He thought he's going to a party with teenage girls. Next mm -hmm. thing, right? And then too embarrassed to tell his parents and then deeper and deeper and deeper. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is why at the age appropriate, it's important to, and you don't want children to find out from a Hollywood movie or something, and which is often distorted toward the Luciferic side anyway, makes it glamorous in its own way. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. You you want to find out you want them to find out from people who love them and and know them. Mm -hmm. One hundred percent, I agree with you on that. One hundred percent. There's not, so much responsibility for parents. If not the parents, I was going to say, and you're in a good situation. Um, I grew up <laughs> fortunately as well, at least yeah. until I was eleven, where I had a lot of extended family around. You mm -hmm. know get along with your parents there was an aunt an uncle my father's cousins who were his age you know so technically the cousins, but we called him uncle you know um one would have been in the marine one in the navy became law enforcement they i could talk to them if i could you know they you had enough people around you who loved you and cared for you um if people have those support people because sometimes parents and america is a very anti-parent anti-child society so if they can't talk to their parents, maybe somebody else in their family they can talk to that's mm -hmm. trusted, that they may listen to. And mm -hmm. that also takes the burden away of the parents always having to tell them these things to be wary of, you know, cautious of. Mm -hmm. There's enough that you have to, especially where you are in Israel and in many countries now. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, I have, this is the other thing, if you have faith uh, and it's used both ways by the Islamists or, you know, other, or Satanists and people, you know, that you're supposed to sacrifice, but that can be in both senses. It can also be that you, you begin to realize later on in life, if not before, even as a child, you can teach to be, to be, um, caring and uh, look out for and be responsible for the younger children. And later on, that comes down to when you're in a situation, I've had situations where, you know, the, the ones and often my teammates who had large families or were the oldest, they tend to be, we all tend to be in the same mindset. If you don't even think, you just run to help somebody, whereas other people run away, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I do think that sometimes that can be imprinted from early age is, is you, you need to be responsible. Yes, you might get hurt. You might get socked in the face, you know, if you go in the middle of this fight to save your brother or something. But that's what you should do. Try and stop it. Mm -hmm. A macro level, that manifests differently. Mm -hmm. 100%. You know... One of the, you know, being proactive, like you were saying, um, and it, it, there's so much that, that, you know, so many opportunities that you're given in, uh, you know, in, in school or what have you in different scenarios, right, with where you're engaging with different people with different worldviews, uh, bullies, etc. Right. And I know for me, um, like, 
I was that guy that could not stand the bullies. And I would be that guy that would stand up and defend the, the young, the weaker, the weaker uh, nerds, so to speak, right? That the bullies were bullying on. And because I was like the guy who was the athlete, but I wasn't like the super popular guy per se. But I was with the, you know, able to hang out with the popular crowd because I was athletic and not this nerd, right? Grew up on the streets, so street smarts kind of deal. Um, but I just wouldn't allow the bullies to bully, you know, those kids, right? And and having that that injustice and standing up towards injustice to me, I think, is a very important thing for kids to have and mm -hmm. to be taught that, hey, you and, and I would teach that with my kids now. Right. Like, you know how that felt when they treated you like that. Don't do that to somebody else. Right. So every time they're, they're you know, somebody does something really wrong to them or whatever, I try to use that not just to like comfort them, but be like, you realize how bad you feel right now. Don't. Don't ever do that to anyone else, you know, and defend somebody who that's happening to. Right. And they're mm -hmm. like, yeah, you're right. You know, I, I need to, you know, and, and, and I love seeing when the light goes on their head because um, the only time and I regret it till this day, the only time I ever stood down was when we had this one kid who was total outsider, total loner, uh, really poor kid, you know, um, and I remember when the kids were laughing at him, making fun of him. And I didn't step up that one time to be like, hey, that's not cool. You guys need to stop it, right? Because they weren't physically hurting him. So I didn't feel the obligation to mm -hmm. step up. And to this day, it's in my mind of, of you know, you know, don't you ever not step up for the weak, for the, for, you know, for those being made fun of or whatever, for, for looking funny, for being different. Um, that really bothered me that that I just I, I, I sissied out on that opportunity um, when 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 I'd stood up so many times <laughs> in other opportunities. Um, yes, for your children, there's many um, in educational pedagogy, they'd call them teachable moments. Yeah. Because if people are so distracted, they're going to miss those teachable moments. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And. Uh, but there's also you mentioned that one and and I won't tell the whole story but there was a, an occasion where there were people shoot I was at my grandparents and there were people shooting in in the front of the house it was an Easter Sunday and with family around and at one point my grandfather just said boss the cozy you know that's enough <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, there were the Brooklyn houses in that time which were sort of up in a hill and you had to go down the steps and anyway, he went down there to tell them. And, and my great aunt, my grandmother, my aunts are at the, you know, crossing themselves and saying prayers are all kneeling down by the table because we're, we're sure that he's going to get killed. <laughs> and, and then he comes back up and then he goes, Kesuja, so, you know, what happened? What, what did you do? Are you crazy going down there? And he goes, no, now they're in the street. If we don't do something, they're going to be at the door. And anyway, I knew this, I taught him in XYZ in public school and, you know, um, and that's when he said he was always, he, he spoke French fluently as well. He spoke four languages and he wow. was quoting Rousseau, I think at the time he was saying, uh, essentially at the time now it would be called sexist language, but um, he said, you know, evil flourishes when good men do nothing or evil flourishes when the good do nothing. But he also said, don't be stupid. You know, if you go down there, you know, like sometimes one of my nicknames, they would call you, you little peanut, you can't go down and do that. You know, you know, it's like, you know, don't come against a, a wall like this, right? Mm -hmm. You just wait till it can be this or you find a way to do this. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, when incrementally, that's what I mean, you can when the child gets a little more sophisticated in their thinking, you can say, OK, but in this case, maybe. You have to ascertain, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, are you going to get your younger brother or sister actually hit by all of these people if you go in? You know, I mean, uh, and that takes a long time. That takes, unfortunately, often firsthand experience learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, sure. and a YouTube video or a PowerPoint slide is not really going to do it. They might just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Wow. So 
as as we're coming to a close here, are there any are there any thoughts that you had that you wanted to share that I might have missed here? Um, well, when we're talking about, I was just speaking about the positive mm-hmm. aspects that are happening. Yes. Part of what I was involved with, I actually got involved with the group that now beca- has become Pathways Negotiation Education Project, which is in Israel and other countries, and which I worked with as part of the project before the move of the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, it's actually started with Roger Fisher out of Harvard, and he came down to Georgetown when I was there. He wrote a book with another called uh, Getting to Yes about negotiation. And I'm very pleased to see that a number of countries or a part of their education um, networks are including negotiation education at middle school and high school level, not just for diplomats or university people. Because I also think it's just as they can imprint in a negative way, if you imprint in a positive way in one 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 to one interaction with children, and it's not done with young children yet, it's done with upper middle school, let's say 13 to 18 year olds. But we did it in Israel and they've been doing it, they're still doing it. And with all sectors of society, Palestinian schools, Druze schools, we went to, um, Orthodox schools, secular schools, Christian schools, have them all meet together. It'd be the first time at that time, a lot of them had ever seen people and interacted with their peer group from a different sector of society. Mm -hmm. I mean, Israel's a small society um, population wise and land wise compared to a lot of these other big countries like Pakistan and the United States. Um, But even on a minor level, you could see even after a few days. And what's most important is to have the teacher's mindset also be able to change um, Mm -hmm. on ways to be able to respect the differences and also ways to do, I don't call it critical thinking anymore. I've been in too many countries where right away, especially in places like Malaysia, you know, um, or China where the government and the government servants like teachers feel threatened if you say the word critical because they think you're going to critique possibly the government or leaders. So don't know critical thinking. But if you say, (laughs) you know, uh, full spectrum thinking, because you don't Mm -hmm. want just to find the bad or the things you want to find the things that possibly have that are not rational in their arguments or could be done differently. So I call it full spectrum thinking is Mm -hmm. teaching them to say, ah, just the way I've been taught is not necessarily the way to, you have to think about it. You can also respect someone's different point of view or try and find out why they are thinking that. Ultimately, after you find out why they're thinking that and you just really believe in every fiber of your being for all sorts of reasons, it's absolutely wrong. Like uh, under what circumstances do you kill a child? You know, I mean, or a baby absolutely wrong. You don't do it, you know, but they are saying, yes, it's all right this way. Okay. Then you may decide, no, you want no part of this thinking anymore. Um, Mm -hmm. But it does give them some tangible skills because a lot of children, I'd say more and more can't even talk, really talk to other people, especially talk to other people of other ages anymore. They're just so used to texting and, um, Mm -hmm having to really talk to people. And uh, that is the first thing that we did for a number of reasons, including that these very clever middle and high school students found out right away some of the assessments we used. If they screenshot them, they could pass them on to the next group we were going. So they already knew the questions we were going to ask. You had to adapt really quickly because they're so fast. So we took away their their phones right away. You know, um, So they had to talk to each other, mm-hmm. interact with each other. And I'm not saying we won't really know the total effects of this for quite some time, but I believe, you know, okay, maybe you reach one out of 10, maybe if you're really lucky, three out of 10, but then maybe they each reach three or four more. I mean, that incrementally is also what happened on the other side, right? They started small and they've gotten bigger. So uh, Mm -hmm. I, I do believe that, Full spectrum thinking is very important. And um, 
the way to guide younger children about that can be, I'm not saying it has to be, but can be with the precepts of your faith as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, li I like that point that you made because that's something I've actually experienced in my growing up here in Israel. Um, like I grew up in Northern Israel that was constantly attacked by Muslim Arab terrorists, right? Extremists. But at the time, I didn't know that there was any difference between Islamist, non-Islamist, you know, whatever terror group name. To me, that, 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 that ethnicity, people group, you know, category of people, to me, that's, that was a threat, right? And it was very hard to differentiate and, and know that there's a difference between no, 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 no. Like those are those people, this is this, and, you know, and, and understand the cause effect and all this. And so I ended up actually in a group where we stayed in the homes of uh, actually Christian Arabs, right? But in a Muslim community, like that was, that was both Muslim and Christian. And so I, I'll never forget waking up to the Muazin you know, in a, in a, in a Muslim village that had Christians in it and that we're staying right in the, in their, in their home. And so in other words, having that personal interaction, and then we had done different activities, went to the desert. Um, we're learning a bunch of, you know, cool things, but together, mm -hmm. but as far as, as far as socially, uh, uh, faith wise, everything, we were so far apart right two different worlds but having those forced interactions so to speak because who else am i going to talk to in the desert and mm -hmm. there were no cell phones and smartphones <laughs> so it's like you know you're kind of forced to engage with this person that's in front of you this human being and and recognize them and see them as a human being and so um i think that's really really good what you're saying there um uh, these these uh programs that you've been working on and I can say from at least personal experience that being on on similar programs um, is is uh, to me it 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 helped shift and change my worldview from just not being uh, exclusive excluding excluding others I guess is the word right and just yeah. like you know no 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 you have nothing to tell me right you know and being able to engage with a wide variety of of uh, of groups. And that's also what you see on this podcast. You know, you see a wide variety of, 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 of characters of people. And, and to me, that's what I want people to be exposed to as well through this podcast. It's not just Daron's worldview. It's <laughs> that you have to, you have to open up your, your, your world a little bit. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do through this podcast is open people's horizons. And, and you know, uh, hopefully it's going to, you know, help pe give people a different perspective than that sole worldview that they kind of been sheltered by and realize there's a whole, whole world out there. You know? I you do. I'm, I learned a lot from your previous podcast with um, Mansoor, is it? And with uh, oh, Mansoor, yeah. and Kareel. Um, and I, I do believe this is where technology can be used as a benefit if you can't mm -hmm. be with them. And also yeah. the tool uh, that can be used worldwide, actually, um, because it can even have the language translated now into other languages. Exactly. I, I would just end here by saying um, I've been privileged by my work to live. And most of the time, I mean, yes, I, I worked on base at HKI and NKC and a few other bases, um, but I the majority of my time overseas has been living with families. At one point in Pakistan, I lived with both a Sunni and a Shia family. I've lived with Hazars in Afghanistan, um, in Russia, in Siberia. There's tribes in Siberia, people just don't realize. <laughs> um, I lived with Cossacks um, as well as, uh, I changed my mind because I had been there during the Soviet Union time in 1973, it was very different than when I went back in 2011, 2012. I had all sorts of prejudices based on that and based on the media about Russians. They were the ones, not the American 
contacts at the State Department that ended up saving an American young Jewish man, in fact. Um, you know, I, every place I've gone, I have been fortunate to meet people who are deeply, deeply good, no matter what faith, Buddhist, Jewish, Christian. Mm -hmm. um, and that also reminds me that um, while there are definitely, you know, somebody who's raised a Satanist, raised a violent extremist, raised in the mud, you know, the, the blood sacrifices in the Mexican cartels and stuff. Okay, you, you really can't expect too much difference from that person probably, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and probably your work in prisons as well. You might have seen, and I've been unjustly in prison myself. So you will see that sometimes people there are more deeply good than the people who are outside or even guarding them. So uh, I, I still have faith in human nature as well, of course, as in God. And mm -hmm. I, I think children, um, it can't be said enough that they are, they are our future. And um, you can no longer now, especially in America, but I think you know, pretty much worldwide, maybe not in Bhutan or some places up in the mountains, but you, you can no longer um, be a bystander and just watch this go by anymore. If you have any consciousness at all, everybody can do some little aspect, whether it's volunteering somewhere um, or if you're a conscionable writer to write about it or even make a short film about it. But always be re remember you're responsible about, I, I try and remember what I'm responsible about speaking. I always try and remember going to these countries I'm often the first American and certainly the first American woman they have ever met face to face. And they're yes. going to take away their idea in Siberia, in, in Pakistan and other places, you know, that's an American to them, who I was to them. Mm -hmm. And with the internet and social media, you have so much distortion of who people are and what the events are. That's why information literacy is an important new skill to learn. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, Joe, this was awesome. I really appreciate this uh, deep dive that we took into all these very important topics. I hope the listeners uh, have something valuable to walk away from, uh, from either one of the t different topics that, that uh, you know, People hear things that they need when they need it. And uh, uh, I've noticed that with myself, right? You know, you'll listen to this whole, you know, message or what have you. And it was that one thing that you're like, oh, yes, that's what I needed. And so I'm always uh, um, I'm always surprised to hear what people will, will actually take away from a message or whatever that, that I'm giving in a public setting. And and I always thought it was so interesting that different people are saying different things. And I'm like, uh, I don't even remember saying that, but awesome. Thanks. You know, and uh, I think we really did cover a lot of really uh, important area that is rarely talked about. And that's why I wanted you to be on this podcast to share your experience, because you have way more experience in this field than I do by far. Um, and uh, and I think it's very important for a lot of uh, parents, for uh, especially educators out there the responsibility they have uh, for their students and the type of people they're going to grow up to be and how they're going to impact society and so on. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so these are really, really important subjects. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing your insights with us and uh, may you have a blessed rest of your week. Thank you very much to Dara Baha Kool. And um, I, I'm honored myself to be on with you, Dora. Dora, you and your family, I wish you all the best. And I will say this too. Am Yisrael Chai Tamid.